Good morning. Beautiful job, beautiful job. Paul, how many song books you need, brother? <laughs> okay. Well, you thought he was confused before. Wait till he comes back. I'm going to put him right down here. Good morning, church. It's good to see you again. Hope everybody's doing well. Oh. If <laughs> I was beginning to look and wonder if we was having a funeral, y'all was awful quiet. I was sitting down there a few minutes ago and, you know, when you come back to a place that you're familiar with somewhat, you start thinking about things from years gone by and 20 however many years ago it was I was chairman of the deacons here he said. and that was during the time I was dealing with the call to the ministry and I had a key to the church and Sometimes at the end of the night shift, I'd come out here and I'd come into church and I'd pray and act silly with God. But God's got a good sense of humor. Some of you may remember the story, but I was sitting down there thinking about it again and I got a little tickled with myself. You know, if those doors are open back there. All you got is glass, right? So I'm up here one night, just me and the Lord, and I'm praying and I'm talking and acting silly, just to be honest. I said, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, then light up that cross. Well, lo and behold, a car came around this curve about that time, and that cross lit up. I said, got the point, I'm out of here. Be careful what you ask for. If you will take your copy of God's word this morning and turn with me to the book of Hebrews chapter three. God's also has a unique sense of humor when it comes to dealing with pastors. You get what you think is the message that he would have you to preach. Then all of a sudden, before time to preach, he starts messing with it. So I ask for your prayers. That my ears and my heart will be where it should be that I'll hear the things that I'm supposed to be hearing and say the things that I'm supposed to be saying. Because the things that are being placed on my heart may not be easy to hear. And they're not easy to preach. I'd a whole lot rather most of the time stand up and talk about joy and singing and praise and all the good things. But unfortunately, life is not always that way, is it? The Bible says there in Hebrews chapter 3 in the 13th verse, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Father, guide us this morning with your Holy Spirit. Speak to us your truth. 
Convict us by your power. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Can I just share some personal things with you? You know, most of you know, if you don't, I was, I was reminded earlier of what I used to do. That I'd forgotten about that particular incident. But I got to meet one of you. Uh, but even in, in that profession, you know, things happen. And in being a pastor, a lot of things happen. I expected in the earlier profession, I expected things to be rough and cruel at times. You don't expect that in church. But beloved, sometimes it can be that way. Some of the hardest people I had to deal with when I was on the patrol were preachers. You don't know how many times I got told I was going to bust hell wide open because I pulled them over. What I'm getting at, folks, some of the cruelest and understand this with love and some of the meanest people that we can encounter sit on the pews of churches. And it's a crying shame. Why is it necessary to have to warn God's people those of us who've received the new nature and are partakers of the adoption against being hardened in heart through the deceitfulness of sin. And the Bible also teaches that there's a method provided by which we as the children of God can be preserved from this great evil. I've always said as far as church is organized religion, we are our worst enemy ourselves. Because we will be very quick to jump on somebody. We'll be very quick to judge somebody. But how quick are we? to put our arms around somebody. How quick are we to encourage somebody? How quick are we to come alongside a brother or a sister not caring what they've done, only that they're hurt? Well, sure, it's it's more expedient to our own egos maybe to condemn. To gossip about. But it's more godly to exhort one another daily. And folks, let me tell you, you're as a church are in a very precarious position. God is still in control, but at this moment, this body is without a shepherd. And don't think for a moment that the devil is not aware and that he will use every instance and tool at his disposal to stir up trouble. Am I being too honest? I've been a Baptist a long time. I know how we are. 
But I just want to be honest with you. Folks, the time is urgent. The word exhort means to beg, to entreat, to beseech. It's the same word that we find in the scriptures used for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, to come alongside. This means that the word exhort includes comfort. The kind of comfort that will encourage us to stand fast in times of trial. Believers are to be constantly exhorting one another to guard themselves against sin and unbelief because the time is short. Folks, today is the day for believing and walking in Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may never get here. Therefore, we're to exhort one another to follow Christ and trust Him as He tells us in His Word in Psalms 90. He says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I had an interesting little episode a couple of weeks ago over at Karen and Mike's house. Some of you may remember Ronaldo, the guy, uh, our, our little Brazil nut friend. Uh, and neighbor now, yeah. The world shrunk. We, I was, we were over at Karen and Mike's and sitting out, just sitting there talking. All of a sudden, I wasn't talking. I wasn't there for about five minutes. I just... Blood pressure bottomed out. And I, I took a little nap. Number our days. Folks, what's important? What's important to you as a body of believers? What's important to you as a child of God? Two of the I'll leave that. I'm trying to listen and talk at the same time. That's hard for me to do. I got a one-track mind sometimes. But people can be hardened. Psalms 95 says, Do not harden your hearts as, the, as in the rebellion in the days of the trial in the wilderness. A person can be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And it may not be a blatant sin like we think about sin a lot of times. Sin looks good, tastes good, feels good, and makes you feel good for a season. But it enslaves human life. And it leaves the heart empty and lonely, insecure, hurting and broken. Over the past 20 some years as being a pastor and ministry, do you know how many heartbroken Christians I've listened to? And you know where a lot of their hearts were broken? By their brothers and sisters. It devastates families, friends, churches, individuals. In addition to all this, sin hardens a person's heart. The more a person sins, the harder and more sinful they become. Sin begets sin, and sin nourishes more and more sin. The more we sin, the easier it is to do. One sin prepares our heart for the next one. You remember the first sin that came into the world, how it hardened Adam's heart against his best friend that when his best friend came seeking him and saying Adam where are you he hid himself and then what did he do he turned around and blamed his best friend for the sin to begin with you remember God that woman you gave me stirred up all this sin can harden our hearts that tender heart of Adam was changed to a stony heart immediately as he tasted that forbidden fruit. 
We may have those in our midst that have been in our midst for a long time that may be in grave danger because of the hardening of their hearts. Because of the deceitfulness of sin. And honestly, to a certain degree, we're all in danger. You say, well, I'm above my heart being hardened. Tell a story. My heart's not above being hardened. Ride with me down 321. It gets hard pretty quick. You know, two of the things, they're not necessarily in and of themselves sin. But you know, two of the things that trouble us most in our churches today that a lot of times does result in sin and does result in hardening not only our hearts but maybe some around us our opinions and our pride Oh, opinions, they're wonderful. God gave us a mind to think and to contemplate on things. But a lot of times our opinions don't line up with the Word of God. And a lot of times they don't line up with the will of God. But our pride makes us say, it's got to be this way. In the eyes of God, folks, that don't fly. So we need to beseech each other and encourage each other daily to seek Him, to seek His Word, to seek His will for our lives as individuals, to seek His will for your life as a body of believers, as a whole family of believers, the church of the living God, to follow Him. Folks, we have got we have got so far off track in our religious lives. Let me go ahead and put this out there. In my humble opinion, religion has caused the damage of more souls and more hearts than any other thing in this world. Religion. Not God but religion, the way man forms it and terms it. I hope y'all understand that. Don't go out here saying, that's a heathen. But folks, we have, in a lot of instances, we have programmed ourselves to death. We have forgotten why we come into this place. It's got to be this way or that way or it won't be any way at all. Whatever happened, I remember growing up and regardless of what some think, I'm not really that old. I remember growing up and the pastor sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes wouldn't even get to preach. Because the heart of the people that came in that had been seeking God had been seeing the wonders of God, were so willing and so full, they would stand and testify the entire service. They would sing, they would praise, they would pray. We would have services where people didn't have to be encouraged or invited to come to the altar. Because it would be full of burdened hearts for one another. It would be full of people crying out for their family members, for their church members. But in a lot of churches anymore, you'll never have to replace the carpet down here because it'll never wear out. We need to exhort one another daily. 
Folks, you can't walk through this world without receiving some sort of contamination. Just like, a, like I said, I have to repent many, many times just trying to drive down to AutoZone in the mornings. Cause, folks, and it may be you, but if, if it's you, you can't drive. <laughs> ah, Swanee. <laughs> but anyway, I'll get off of that. Uh, without the pureness of Jesus Christ, being forefront in our lives. We all stand that danger being hardened in our hearts. Let me make you a little more aware of how the sins of God's people can be of particular use to Satan and his cause. You know, when I used to, when we used to be on the road, Steve, we'd see an old drunk doing what a drunk would do. We wouldn't think a whole lot about stuff like that. You know, I'm not likely to go out and imitate what they do. But if I see somebody that's been an example in my life that I highly respect doing things that are out of Christian character, maybe my first instinct would be to make excuses for them. Well, maybe they were just having a bad day, what, you know, whatever excuse I could come up with. But then I got to thinking, well, I made an excuse for him. I'll make an excuse for me. Little by little, the heart will harden. So encourage each other every day because association with inconsistent Christians has been the downfall of many young believers. Satan delights in using God's own to destroy and to catch folks in his own nets the young, impressionable minds of babes in Christ begin to think, well, if these are good people and they're on their way to heaven, maybe I don't have to watch my life as closely as I should have. We arrive at the decision what we once avoided is sin may not have been sin at all, and we think that we indulge in it without restraint, and step by step we come down to the level of this evil generation in which we're living. It's like a pond during the winter time. Temperature drops. You may not see it at first. It may take somebody with a trained eye to be able to see it, but that thin layer of ice starts to skim over the top. Maybe it wouldn't even hold a pen to begin with. But folks, the longer that cold stays there, the thicker and the harder that ice gets. Same with sin in our hearts, in our lives. A lot of folks don't like some of my terminology sometimes. Well, kind of hate that, but I'm, I am, I'm not Popeye. I am what I am. I'm plain spoken. I'm honest to you. How many paper Christians are in our churches today? So well, what is a paper Christian? Somebody that thought they were buying fire insurance because they shook a preacher's hand and Signed on a little card or something somewhere. And called themselves Christians. And then somebody coming in trying to have that relationship are so discouraged and their hearts get hardened by those that are faking it. Encourage each other daily. Don't raise your hand. Don't volunteer anything. But in your church life, how many folks do you know 
that you have watched their hearts grow cold their attitudes sour their joy dwindle they are those that that occurs That's one of the things I've enjoyed over the last few years is being able to visit different churches and get to preach in different places. And you can almost pick them out. Not always, but a lot of times, from my perspective from up here, you can see them. Mad at the world. And the one who created it. Just huff, just looking, begging for an excuse to be miserable or to be ill about something. Is it their fault? Well, partly. But who else is responsible? Those brothers and sisters sitting around them, that's who. Somebody needs to love them. Somebody needs to encourage them. Somebody needs to lift them up and see what it is that's causing them such distress in their spiritual life. We need to be about heeding seriously the command of Scripture and begin to call out and to reach out to those who have wondered from the fold and bring them back into God's house and into right fellowship with Him. But folks, there's a right and a wrong way to do it. This is another one of our Christian characteristics, if you want to call it that. I hope you can see I'm smiling when I say that because that was a little sarcastic. I'll give you an example. And forgive me, I'm, I, I'm not perfect, so for what I'm fixing to tell you, I don't want to hear a gasp out of nobody. Because most of you remember it, some of it. I used to love to chew tobacco. All right, now that you got your breath back, we'll go on. And I was here when this happened. I had a brother in Christ come to my house and give me one of these. Let me go ahead and just tell you how big a heathen I am. I used to smoke cigarettes too. I never will forget. Well, I ain't going to go there. I'm being too open. But you know what? That didn't help me quit you. That made me mad. I'll be honest with you. The Bible says to exhort one another. To encourage. To love. Don't condemn don't just browbeat the fool out of somebody. Love them. And encourage them. Folks, every day is important. We got to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit every day. We must not let sin deceive us and allow our hearts to be hardened. We must take heed and watch lest we depart from God like Israel did. We have to be about the Father's business now before it's too late. Probably not a good time for me to have looked at my watch. Because I ain't but about half through. But there are some folks that try to provoke God. Some in Israel had heard the Holy Spirit of God, yet they didn't 
heed his exhortation. They sinned, rebelled against God, doing their own thing. They lived as they wanted to, not believing or trusting in God, and they provoked him. And tragically, that's true today. Some sin and harden their hearts and are provoking God. Folks, that's a dangerous thing. So let me warn you with all the love and concern of my heart that it's a grievous sign of hardness when we can live content without the fellowship of His continual presence. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I performed among them? Folks, how long will we harden our hearts? How long will we bicker among ourselves? How long will we allow opinions and pride to override the will of God in our lives and in our churches? Judgments, sure. It was with Israel and so it will be today. If we try to always see just how close to the edge we can come, how close to the sun we can fly without getting burned, judgment will come. Proverbs says his righteousness leads to life so he that pursues evil pursues it to his own death. That may not only be physical death, spiritual, to a body of believers, to a community, to a family. There are people who are in danger at this very moment. What will you do for their lives? What will you do for your life? Exhort one another. And we're told to do it daily. And we are to begin to do it while it is still called today. That's a preacher's job. Really? It's not what the Bible says. It says exhort one another. Everybody. Preachers, yes. Sunday school teachers, absolutely. Youth leaders, without a doubt. Our elders in the church, most definitely. Because all of you have different perspectives and ways to encourage and lift your people up. Some of you remember Miss Dawn, my wife and Karen's grandmother. I love to sit in this, it was like a, what do you call it, the Victrola. I like to get her wound up sometimes and to sit and listen to her talk. Because there was a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of funny stuff, but there's a lot of wisdom. When we have our elder statesmen and a body of believers, if we'll listen, they have seen things, they've experienced things that we have not. They've walked paths and had blessings and results for problems from the Lord that we couldn't even imagine. So yes, we need everybody to exhort one another. All of us without exception, whether we're rich, poor, we need to see to each other's souls. Strive for the good of those around you. 
Maybe you know somebody who's struggling or, or backsliding in some way or in some other type of spiritual decline. Don't talk to your neighbors about it. You don't even necessarily have to talk to your preacher about it. Talk to God about it. And when your heart is right with Him, you knew I'd throw that one in, didn't you? When your heart is right with Him, then go and talk with them and encourage them. The time is short. And we must be about what He's called us to do. How about you this morning? Is your heart hardened by sin? Have you been deceived by the things of this world? Have you grown cold to the things of Christ? Then let me exhort you. Let me encourage you. Remember where you first met him. Not at a church. Not at an altar. But at the cross. Return to the cross. The Christ of the cross. And it is there He is waiting to restore you, to lift you up, to encourage you, to love you beyond anything that I could even begin to tell you. Don't be deceived by sin. You're here and you don't know Him as your Lord and Savior. The same thing goes for you. He loves you. Don't matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, what you've been through. He loves you. Because He created you. He not only created you, He sustained you. He not only created and sustained you, but He sent His only Son to die for you. So that you could have eternal life and one day come to live eternally with Him. So let me encourage you. Regardless of where you are. Come to Him. Whether your heart's hardened, whether it's not, just come to Him. And say, Lord, I love you. Thank you for loving me. You know, it don't hurt sometimes. You know, if you've ever grown a garden, you know what a hoe is, don't you? Go out there and scratch around on that ground a little bit, soften it up whether there's any weeds there or not. Helps the crops grow. Makes them healthy. Will you not allow the Holy Spirit to do a little cultivating in your heart? Maybe some of that crust is growing up, getting a little hard. Be not allowing to speak to your heart and make it a fertile ground for His glory once again. Father, thank You for this time we've had in Your Word. Thank You, Lord, for the power of it. The preciousness of it. Now, Lord, we Leave it in your promise that it will do what you sent it out to do. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name. Whatever the Lord would have you to do as we sing. Yeah, please.